so lab went okay for people. I saw a lot of people were doing experiments and asking really interesting questions. So responsive images, nice stuff, lets you control how much you pull in. <clears throat> now we're going to move away from the design side and more into JavaScript. And I need to talk about two core technologies, and that's Fetch and Promises. Most of you have heard of them, some of you have used them. Uh, and normally we would go and deep dive Fetch and deep dive Promises, except they're kind of tied together. So we're going to do a super short intro here and then a deeper dive early tomorrow. So how many people have used XML HTTP request? How many people like XML HTTP request? <laughs> right, no hands up. I mean, let's be fair, XML HTTP request is old enough to drink. It's, it's over, um, actually it's over 21 years old, which in the US makes it old enough to drink. Um, it was built, it, I mean it was basically built in around 1993 or so by Microsoft in order to build a web Outlook client. And then everybody else started using it. But I mean, it's basically based on events, it's based on callbacks. It's an old style API, did a great job at the time. But what we like to work with now has moved. And so Fetch is a new modern replacement for XML HTTP request. And it's quite a bit simpler. <clears throat> so I'll call Fetch on a file. This is an asynchronous operation. It's going to take a while, so I need to know when it's finished. I add, it returns an object called a promise. Dot then is a method on the promise that takes this function and schedules it to run after the fetch. So think of this as being a callback. <coughs> this callback gets the response from the fetch. Response has a JSON conversion method. That does a conversion to JSON and it returns that value and you can do something with it. And if there's any errors, a catch will catch errors from anything above it. Nice and simple. Even easier than the jQuery Ajax method, which is pretty cool. But this is even simpler. <clears throat> Let's see. Yeah, let me do this first. All right, so just a side note. <clears throat> So everybody in here has been using um, JavaScript you know, up through ES5. You're pretty, you're pretty comfortable with that. You know what it looks like. We're actually using for some of the examples in some of the labs ES6, otherwise known as ES2015, where you can define a function by giving a list of arguments, the fat arrow equals greater than, and then the function body. Other than this handles this much better, um, it's just easier to read sometimes. It's just a cleaner syntax. So when you see parenthesis, fat arrow, think this is a func anonymous function taking those values. <coughs> I can tell my voice is going to have trouble today. Okay. Huh. So there's the example there. We, we circled it because, you know. That's so the camera can see it, right? So let's try some examples. So <clears throat> if you do this in the console, in fact, we'll do this in a minute, we're going to fetch a file, index.html, so we're going to need one of those, and then take the response object, pull its text out, and then take the text and log this to the console. By the way, what does this chain of thens look like? I know there's Unix people in the room. It's a pipe. Yeah, it's basically you're just piping from one function to the next. So let's do this. <coughs> now for this to work, I need an index.html, which I have conveniently written one already. I need a web server. Now, there's a bunch of ways to do it. You can use the web server built into Node. You can use the one built into Python. The one that we use for a lot of examples around here is a Chrome extension called basically just the web server, or web server for Chrome, 200 OK. 
Yes, you see some super secret things on that screen. And so web server for Chrome says it's pointing at the scratch folder, gives me a URL, which I'll click. OK, great, there's my index.html. Now I can go write some code. I'm going to go ahead and open my console. I've already made the font nice and big. I'm going to save myself some typing by copying that, flipping over to Chrome, finding the window, not that window, that window, pasting it in. And so what happens? A promise gets returned from this whole stack. The promise status here says pending because it was an asynchronous operation. That promise is returned immediately from fetch. Now, it has already gone out in the meantime and fetched the file and displayed it, as you can see here. So if I open up that promise, it's actually resolved. It's no longer pending. It actually contains the data. <clears throat> and then you could see that it extracted the text and displayed it at the bottom of the screen. That is, by the way, probably the shortest web page you can create. You don't need a head. You don't need a body. Those are actually inferred from content in HTML5. That's about 70 characters. You could put two of those in a tweet. Oh, the joke fell flat. OK. <laughs> um, oh, here's the other thing. So notice in the promise, value undefined. The value is actually invisible to you here because the, the promise value actually is tied to the web security model. It can only be read by the origin that asked for it. So in this case, the origin was that, that particular page. So only that page can read what's in the promise. If I had a cross-origin request, which we'll talk about in a minute, it would be opaque, but you could pass it to the other origin. <clears throat> now, I can do the same thing. I could do the same thing with JSON. I won't bother. It's a pretty straightforward demo. I could read a JSON file in the response called response.json, which is built into the response object, and get a JSON object back out. So there are response readers for text, JSON, and a blob. So if you just need a, a blob of data, you can read it this way. Things like reading an image file and dynamically installing it can be done this way. <laughs>